Oh, okay, welcome everyone to tonight's joint uh, council and community okay. hold meeting, uh, April 18th, 2023. For those in our room here and those at home, you might see a couple of different faces at the yeah. end of the table. Our CEO and our mayor are representing the community in Toronto at the Ontario Good Roads Association conference this week. So, in my role as deputy mayor, I'll be chairing the meeting this evening. We'd like to open as we always do with our land acknowledgement and we've been rotating it through councillors to, to present and I believe tonight is my turn so I'll share that message opening our meeting. Uh, so the municipality of West Nipissing respectfully acknowledges that we are located on the homelands of the Anishinaabe peoples on the traditional territory of the Nipissing, Tomogamy and Dokis First Nations covered by the Robinson Huron Treaty. We honour and recognize their historical connection to the land and value their significant contributions in shaping and strengthening our communities. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility towards reconciliation and improving our understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. So that uh, being said, I just before we get into uh, some of the resolutions and, and movements here, I just want to uh, acknowledge that we have a group of uh, community members here with us tonight. And as we shared last time, we had a, a larger group just to uh, remind those to respect the decorum of council chambers that we're all here uh, within the context of this meeting. And uh, please refrain from your comments in the room. If you do have stuff you'd like to chat about, we have room outside in the uh, lobby for those discussions to take place. Uh, so that being said, we'll move forward with the declaration of pecuniary interest. I'll ask if there's any around the table. So the next item is the agenda and adopting that for this evening's proceedings. It is moved by Councillor Gagne and seconded by Councillor Carré. Be it resolved that the agenda for the meeting of council held on April the 18th be approved as proposed. All those in favor? Carried. So that being said, we have our delegation and petition section. We do have one delegation this evening. It's from the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation, or MPAC. And I'd like to introduce Steve MacArthur, if he'd like to come to the podium to share some important info. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And, and nice to meet you all, all new faces around the table here. Um, my name is Steve MacArthur. I am your account manager for the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. And uh, I cover a territory that uh, is from West Nipissing to Tomogamy in the north, to Mattawa, Mattawan in the east, and as far south as Whitney and Algonquin Park. So we have 19, I have 19 municipalities that we service out of the North Bay office. And um, the purpose of my, my presentation tonight is we like to come out early on in, in Council's new term and just tell you what it is we do, how we do it, why we do it, and answer any questions you might have about the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. I'll be brief. I know I have 10 minutes and you have a full agenda, so I appreciate you giving me a little uh, time on the agenda to, to introduce myself. A uh, little background. I um, started in municipal world. I was the city planner in North Bay for a better part of a decade and then in economic development, and I've been with MPAC now almost eight years. So I understand very much what happens at the municipal office level and around council chambers and uh, just thought I'd put that context out there. I'm not sure who's clicking. Thank you, Melanie. Could you uh, click the next one, please? Normally we start with a video. We're going to skip the video tonight. It's a few minutes long, but I would encourage, and I'll come back to this later as to where we can find this, but especially for new counselors who might not be familiar with the assessment and taxation work that MPAC does um, to, to watch this video. And for anybody watching at home or attending um, it explains how the, the relationship between assessment and taxation in, in really uh, easy to understand language. I call it an Etch-a-Sketch etch video, walks you through it, and it's available on our YouTube channel. So I'll come back to that. Thank you. Try the arrows on the uh, keyboard. Oh, oh, you might have hit play. No, I didn't mean to do that. Crashed. No, Adobe Acrobat's not responding. It's being. <laughs> just a second. I'm just going to escape out of there and see if I can reshare. Sorry about that. Yeah. 
you need to, Mr. Sharm, I can open up my presentation and just work my way through it if necessary. Phillips, that's, that would be my daughter. <laughs> She's lovely. Yeah, I know, but that's not what we're looking for. <laughs> we're kind of looking for the impact presentation. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. That's okay. Slide three. It doesn't want to go by. For some reason, it's not liking going by this escape slide. Out, escape out of the slideshow for a second. Just click on this so we can get past them. Yeah. Oh, I don't it's really the one. Just hit escape so you go back to seeing all the slides. Like the slide shuffler. Yeah, it's frozen again. It's been a quick set. Okay. Yeah. Use the little arrows oh, on there. No, it's um. Yeah. yeah. You, oh. There we go. There we go. Sorry about that. That's okay. Technical difficulties. That's what happens when you blame us for embedding a, a video <laughs> into the presentation. Uh, so a little bit uh, of context for the people around uh, council chambers. Uh, the assessment taxation system in Ontario, this is the four major players in it. The Ontario government sets the rules under the Assessment Act, specifically through the Ministry of Finance. We are a not-for-profit corporation funded by the municipalities we serve, 444 municipalities in Ontario and the unorganized territories. We, uh, the municipalities, you determine what you need to spend, your projects, your budgets, what you, what you need to operate uh, the municipality. And we deliver the assessment role to you. And ultimately, that's at the end of the line is the property owners as we are here. And uh, that's how it's divvied up and they pay their share of the property taxes for the community services and education that's provided within the municipality. Next slide, please. So maintaining Ontario's property database is a pretty big deal. We have 5.5 million properties that we take care of around the province. And in addition to doing all that, we also do the things that you see on the slide in front of you. We do our forecasting and market analysis and trends. We're always watching what's happening in terms of the sales and the new builds and all the construction that's going on. We process um, uh, severances and consolidations because we realize how important that is to get those onto the roll quickly and to get building permits out the door for people who are, are creating new, new properties and new builds. We also... Um, uh, process vacancy and tax applications, things like if there's a fire and, and someone's home is destroyed, uh, we work with the municipality and with the, with the owners to make sure that their, their uh, property tax is adjusted to reflect that they don't have to uh, face that extra burden. And then, of course, requests for reconsideration and appeals. So when someone doesn't agree with the assessment, uh, there's processes that are available to them to uh, to um, argue that, and, and uh, we work on that on an ongoing basis. Next slide, please, Billy. So uh, on top of that, we conduct property valuation updates referred to as reassessments. So um, there's a number of triggers that can lead to a reassessment on a property. Uh, there's a slide that introduces that. Maybe I'll jump to the next one and talk about the reassessment date. So in 2020, we were two weeks from going out with our assessment notices, our property assessment notices for every property in Ontario. Every four years, it's like our Olympics, we reassess every property and we send out a notice to all property owners. If you recall March of 2020, pretty big deal. Uh, the government uh, paused the reassessment to deal with uh, COVID and for the municipalities to have the time and, and to deal with that. and. Um, and rightfully so, there were bigger things on our, everyone's plate. Uh, the reassessment has not been, the reassessment date has not yet been announced by the province. So we are waiting with bated breath like everyone else for that to happen. Uh, we're, we really don't have an indication at this point when that will be, but there's ongoing discussion between the highest levels of our organization and the government. So right now, all the properties continue to be based on what they would have been worth on January 1st, 2016, which is known as the current uh, valuation date or current value assessment. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So the CVA, as I just described, it's a value at a point in time and it's the legislated valuation date. So it's the date that the government says you shall uh, treat all properties in Ontario 
at, at their value on that particular date. It also reflects uh, what a willing buyer is willing to pay a willing seller on the open market for a property or for a home. Next slide, please. So right now, it's a good time to come and speak to you, especially those who aren't familiar with any of this, because all property values for the 2022 and 2023 tax years are still based on January 1, 2016, which means in essence, they've been frozen for the time being. They're at uh, their 2016 phase-in, which I'll explain on the very next slide. So phase-in refers to um, a program that was introduced by the government that if your property increases uh, between assessment cycles, so between 2016, or let's use 2020 and 2024, for example, and it was to go up $100,000 as an example, um, the government decided that it wasn't appropriate to put that whole full load on the very first year of the assessment cycle. And the phase in simply speaks to the fact that it's, it's applied over four years of the assessment cycle. So it would go up 25,000 a year in terms of your assessment notice until the full phase in value is achieved at hundred percent. That's what this, this slide is demonstrating. So we have been at the high end of the phase in value for 2016 since 2020, if you can follow that. Okay, next slide. So how we do what we do, the, the five major factors that go into our residential assessments, location, lot size, quality of construction, square footage, and age of the property. I think most of these, pretty under, easy to understand. Location in particular, there's only a finite amount of waterfront land, for example. They're not making more of it. So it continues to go up and be desirable and go up in value. Lot size, obviously, the more land you have and the more frontage you have, the, the more valuable it is. And, you know, there's even the potential for some of that to be severed and depending on if it meets the requirements and things like that. So that factors in the value. The quality of construction really gets down to, mpac has been doing this for over 40 years. So we really know in our systems, based on building permits and building plans and details, what, what's in the house? Is it a steel roof? Is it a shingle roof? Is it a laminate flooring? Is it is it tile? In, in you know, in floor heating, all those types of details go into the evaluation. And of course, the square footage and the age of the property uh, factor into that as well. Next slide, please. And then, of course, we can't do all properties. There's properties that don't sell very often or unique. Mills, mines, warehousing things that we we um, cost or or assess based on the cost approach, which is basically uh, looking at what it would cost to to re uh, rebuild that property if it was flattened and start all over again, minus depreciation for the age of the structures and things like that. It's an easy way to think of that. Yes, please. Thank you, Melanie. Um, what we've been doing in this time in the pause of the reassessment, two major things that came out of it, and I don't want to call them silver linings because there was nothing good about that time for anybody, but it allowed us to clear off a backlog of appeals in the province, it meant that some of them went back many years. Some of those large uh, commercial operations, they'll have banner appeals, that appeal all their stores, for example, across the province, and those can take many years. And uh, as the finance staff will tell you, that's that's a, like a liability sitting on your, your books in terms of waiting for that to settle and know, know what the final assessment value of those is. The other thing it allowed us to do was pivot and really um, expand our building permit and plan process. And I gotta give a ton of credit to Alain and, and Tanya and the staff here because they are, are fantastic to deal with and have, have really embraced this process. We get every building permit and, and plan now uploaded into our system. So we get the details of all of that. And we have a service level agreement with you folks, with the municipalities that says within one year of occupancy being granted or final inspection, that we add that to the role. Okay. So that's a, that's a far change for those who've been around a while. They'll know that that's a, that's a great um, improvement in our service. And that's important for you because it's new revenue for the municipality to pay for the things you, you need. Next slide, please. So 
when the reassessment comes and, and again i reiterate i don't know when it is we all we watch the spring economic statement and the fall economic statement and wait for the announcement from the province but we know everyone around here has seen what's happened in the real estate market particularly since COVID, uh, and it's not just uh, west nipissing it's the entire region the the, the building uh, the Sale prices continue to go up, or at least have leveled off slightly, but it's been a very desirable place for people to come live and move to. And, uh, and there's been a migration out of the big cities towards this area. So when the reassessment comes, we're anticipating that we will have some uh, questions about the, the assessment values. And, this, and we have a um, number of resources to help people when that, when that happens. I ask another purpose of my presentation tonight is for those tuning in, when you get your property assessment notice on it, there is a unique login key for aboutmyproperty.ca. You can log into that and see the details of up to, up to 20 similar sized properties or neighbors' properties to know whether your value is, is, is on par with the rest of them. And allows you through that process to submit a request for reconsideration if you don't agree with the value that's that's been assessed. Next slide, please. So the video that we couldn't watch, but I, I very much encourage you to, to check out um, and is, uh, speaks to your property's assessed value that we provide. Our interest is getting the assessed value of your property, right? What's it worth? What's it classified as? You know, commercial, industrial, residential. Make sure that we have, or, or an apportionment of those. What's it, what's it classified as? And then... Um, the municipality uses that to, to you know, sets the tax rates based on those different property types and everyone pays the property taxes uh, based on, on their fair share, if you will. Um, simple, uh, but at the end of the day, our, our role in this system is about the, getting the property value correct. Correct the classification and the property value. So if the, if the concern is about the taxes, that really belongs at the council chambers, if I can make, make sense of that. Our interest is about getting the value of the property and the classification correct. Next slide, please. So we are preparing for the next reassessment and you, anyone who's on social media might see these little uh, pop-up ads and things that we're preparing for. Um, because we haven't had a reassessment in eight years and we've seen what's going on in the market, we, we know what's happening. And again, that, that video is, is part of the toolkit that we provide and, and maybe Alyssa can share that or, or Melanie and we can provide that to council. It's worth two minutes of your time to really understand what's happening. But it also should quell some fears because it, the bottom line, the message of the video is even if the assessments increase, if we're adjusting the tax rate to offset that increase, it doesn't necessarily equate to big tax property tax increases around the municipality. Okay, um, and it explains why that is. If they're all going up, and I can tell you uh, anecdotally that West Nipissing is doing very, very well. You we were only second only for the 19 municipalities to the city of North Bay in terms of growth and construction, and that's kudos to everyone who works there and what's going on in the and making it a desirable place to live. We also provide an in-touch newsletter, which is specific for municipalities, stories of interest of similar sized municipalities or, or things that come up uh, for with assessment related matters around the province. And if there's anything of interest, uh, it'll certainly be shared by the staff to the, to the council that's, that's relevant for the community, but that is provided. Next slide, please. <coughs> There's the InTouch newsletter, as I said. We also have social media feeds. We have a YouTube channel where this video is. I'll make sure that uh, as a follow-up, because we, we uh, didn't want to risk playing the video tonight, that I'll send, send the toolkit email out again, and, and it can be shared with you. And I've given you each of my cards. On it is my, my cell phone, which is also on the next slide. And it's the only number I have. I, I, those, uh, those cards are outdated because we're all working uh, in a different environment now, but that's, that's in my pocket if anyone wants to try it and, and test it. But the point of that is, in putting it up there, is that it's important that council understand the relationship between assessment and, and taxation, 
but it's also equally important that you don't have to answer questions about assessment. That's that's my job, and that's our staff's job. And so I'd encourage anybody who who has those questions about how 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 their property is valued and whether we've got it, the details of that property right. To log into aboutmyproperty.ca, see that we can literally see how many bedrooms and bathrooms and things we have for your property and the size of it and all those details. And if we don't have it right, contact us. And I can tell you on, on uh, the process for getting that updated. And that's it. That's all I wanted to do. Um, and I'd happy to happily answer any questions that anybody might have tonight. That's great. Thank you very much, Steve, for the presentation. I know as a newer council we have a lot of uh, new people around the table and an old guy like me who's been away for a couple of years so it's definitely good to hear that uh, presentation understand that i'll open the floor if there's any questions from anyone around the table we've well, done a good job when there's no <laughs> questions like that. home for puck drop i'm not <laughs> that's, that's great. Thank, you. thank you for being with us tonight appreciate it So we'll now move into the committee of the whole portion of the agenda for this evening, and I will turn it over to Councillor Crochet for the Economic Development Committee. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jean. Um, donc à l'ordre du jour aujourd'hui pour le développement économique, on a la présentation stratégie d'aménagement du territoire et de développement pour l'ancien site du Moulin. Uh, donc je vais passer la parole à Stéphane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, our consultants are with us virtually, I believe we'll allow them into the presentation and they'll take it over from here and present the council the findings of the uh, land use study. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Paul Hicks and I'm joined this evening by our resident uh, Urban designer Michelle Blom to walk you through the, uh, the 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 land use and development strategy for the former mill site. We do have a slide deck that I believe is in the hands of the clerk's department. If I'm if I'm wrong on that one, let me know and we can bring bring it up. I was uh, I thought uh, you were yeah, going I, to run it, but I absolutely have it right here. Yeah, I think you, I think yeah. we can we can run it. I'm just pulling it up here. It's up. Very good. Okay, so we, we will get started. So again, good evening, members of council. Very happy to be back before you this evening to present the land use and development strategy for the former mill site in Sturgeon Falls. As I mentioned, I'm joined by my colleague, Michelle Blom, who is a resident urban designer, and she was instrumental in preparing the land use strategy and the conceptual layout of the site that we're gonna present to, uh, to, to committee this evening. Perhaps we could jump to the next slide. So this is the agenda that we wanted to go over um, with, with council and committee this evening. Um, we're going to talk to you uh, a little bit about the process for developing the strategy, um, a little bit about the public consultation that took place and the feedback that we received from the public and the community. Speak a little bit about how the concept itself was developed, outline the strategy itself, and finally we'll provide an overview of the associated implementation plan or the roadmap for undertaking development on, on, on the property. So this was this was a, a, a redevelopment strategy for the former mill site. So there's two primary components to the strategy that Michelle's going to explain in, in, in greater detail. Um, but there was the development of a conceptual plan, a conceptual land use plan for this for the site, and then also an implement an associated implementation strategy with the ultimate goal of seeing the, the, the site redeveloped. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to my colleague Michelle, and she's going to walk you through um, a, 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 through the the development of the land use strategy and and the land use strategy itself. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, so I can uh, start off with telling you a little bit about the um, the development of the land use and development strategy and just the process that our team undertook to get to where we are today. So the process was a four phase process and that began with establishing the site's potential. And this had um, two phases, the first being uh, background analysis, looking at policy, existing plans, and also spatial analysis of the surrounding community, and also undertaking public consultation and gaining public input on the site and also general uh, information on, on the community and on West Nipissing itself. This led us into developing um, the visioning and programming 
um, phase of, of the process. And this started with uh, developing preliminary goals and a vision for the project. And finally, developing two concept plans, which were then uh, reviewed by the overall project team. From here, the project team identified a preferred concept that was then taken to uh, create the land use and development strategy, which, as Paul mentioned, there are two components, the land use development strategy and the implementation plan to really guide the project in the future phases um, so that the municipality can have some guiding principles and key information on how to move forward with the project. And for us throughout the whole process, um, especially through the public consultation and public input and the background analysis, it became very clear to us that the story of the former mill site intertwines the rich his historical, cultural and natural tapestry of West Nipissing. Um, and this is because the, the site is so layered and it has so much um, history in terms of the natural history of, of the falls to the industrial his history and just the location at the center of the urban area and the downtown of uh, Sturgeon Falls itself. And this really rang true in what we heard from the public throughout our consultation. And what we did was hold uh, one public consultation session as well as a public survey uh, to gain a little bit more information on um, life in West Nipissing and, and kind of the, the things people love about West Nipissing and, and the meaning of the site itself to residents and, and participants to the, to the survey and to the session. And really what, what came out from the session was, um, again, what people uh, uh, loved about West Nipissing. It's um, bilingual nature, it's uh, access to, um, you know, natural areas, to provincial parks, and also the, the, the culture and, and community feel of the area. And then in terms of the site itself, um, it was clear to us that the site is, is um, a, a symbol of history for the community, of its industrial history and also natural history, um, but also a, a chance for a new beginning, as one resident put it. Put it. Um, a really uh, a chance for a step forward and a, an example for change as the community moves forward um, into the future. And as we move forward into a little bit more detail on what residents were looking for in terms of uses on the site, um, there were a couple consistencies when we were speaking with the public. Um, and the first use that came up the most was um, parkland and recreational uses, um, also active transportation and trail systems being integrated on site. Um, a mix of housing, so uh, affordable housing, uh, access to seniors housing, and just different housing typology, typologies in general. Um, the integration of community uses and um, making sure that future development really has that historic representation and interpretation um, of the history of the site itself. And what this allowed us to do with the background analysis and the uh, public consultation was to begin to develop a concept. And this began with developing a vision for the site. And the vision is as follows. The development of the former mill site will reestablish a strong connection between the community and the Sturgeon River through the creation of a vibrant riverfront park and mixed use urban space. Providing new opportunities for recreation and economic growth will breathe new life into these culturally and historically significant lands. And in order to uh, achieve this vision, the team developed six goals for the strategy. The first was to develop a strong connection to the Sturgeon River and surrounding environment. The second, providing a range of housing options for the community. Next, celebrating the city's historical, ecological, and industrial heritage. Uh, fourth, being sustainable, restorative, and resilient. Fifth, promoting local entrepreneurship and business development. And lastly, being a catalyst for private development and investment in the community. And moving uh, from conceptual goals and vision into um, what the, the land use strategy does spatially and, and in terms of the, the layout and design on the ground, the team really uh, started with the first goal and that was developing a strong connection to the Sturgeon River and surrounding environment and also the surrounding community. And this is really because the site today or even the riverfront today is, is, is a very disconnected riverfront when it comes to accessing uh, the river itself uh, through trail networks and pathways. While there are pathways located along Minnehaha Bay uh, to the marina and also a, a pathway next to the Legion um, on the east side of the waterfront, just due to the geographical conditions and private land ownership in the area, it's been very 
uh, difficult to connect these trail networks and also create um, a larger north-south connection along the river that you might see um, along other uh, 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 rivers uh, and communities um, that have a significant river running through them. So given that the municipality has acquired the former mill lands, uh, the project team saw it as a very huge opportunity to develop a uh, experience along the river using a riverfront loop. So this is a, a proposal to develop multi-use pathways along the riverfront, along the west, east, north, and south of the former mill lands and of the river surrounding it in order to create um, an experience around the riverfront and also connect um, the, the riverfront to the surrounding community, so to the downtown and to the western lands of Sturgeon Falls. And of course, um, surrounding this multi-use trail would be a community park. Um, this would be a naturalized community park, which would provide uh, viewpoints along the river, um, resting points, and really provide this access to nature um, that people might experience outside of the urban area, but really bring it into the community and into the downtown along the riverfront, um, giving more access to views of the falls. And given this, and, and, and given the creation of an attractive and vibrant community park and multi-use trail system, our team proposes creating the larger area as the falls district as a way to promote development, um, economic development, attraction of tourism, and housing opportunities along the site. And this concept was really reflected in the creation of the um, preferred concept land use plan. And the land use plan really stems off of the riverfront park idea, um, looking at the different opportunities uh, along the former mill site lands to really integrate uh, a mix of uses that can really maximize um, different opportunities for the site and really achieve the goals set out in the strategy. So as you can see here, um, the proposal is to develop highway commercial along Highway 17, of course, due to the high tr car traffic and visibility along the route. Um, we have a, a smaller area for urban commercial, and this is really focused on ground-oriented public-facing units, um, creating a modest neighborhood center for the existing community and also the new community being integrated into the site. To the north, you can see residential uses. Uh, and these could be low to mid density residential uses, um, which would be abutting the riverfront park, really focusing on access to parkland and access to um, the existing multi-use network that would be in the area uh, throughout the riverfront park. And lastly, we have the West of Pissing Power Generation lands, which of course are an existing use, uh, an existing industrial use, but, um, the, the land use strategy outlines that the lands will be moderately extended to really allow for adequate space for future and existing operations to make sure um, West Nipissing power generation can uh, continue to perform to its maximum capacity. And this concept led to the creation of the final land use and development strategy. Um, the strategy uh, took these, these four land uses and integrated them into a final plan and outlined a little bit more information about each use and also looked at the potential road layout and looking at um, multi-use trail network layout to really see how people can move around the site and, and understand how the site can work itself. So you can see here, this is the um, final land use development plan. And in the, um, in the document, we outline uh, different details um, for each use. Um, this can be seen in the document just to go over some, some general guiding principles uh, for each use. We have firstly residential uses. Um, the idea of these residential uses are really to focus on affordability and accessibility, um, looking at integrating different typologies into West Nipissing, such as stack townhomes, multifamily residential, and also townhouse typologies, and really focusing on public space and, and access to uh, parkland and public trails. Next, we have the urban commercial use, and this is really about being strategic about the type, amount, and location of urban commercial uses to ensure their success and really give opportunities for um, smaller format retail for local businesses and community-centric uh, spaces. Next, we have highway commercial uses, and of course, this is a, a bit different than the urban commercial use. It's this larger format retail, 
um, for that high high traffic corridor uh, that can really draw people in. Um, and of course, this is these uses are similar to the existing highway commercial that is located along Highway 17. But of course, making sure that with architectural detailing and landscaping, um, the, the historical importance and cultural importance of the site can be maintained through materials and detailing, um, natural, natural materials, architectural details, and really attempting to create a gateway development to get people not just, just to stop on Highway 17, but to really uh, be pulled into the site and enjoy the site as well. And lastly, we have the uh, parkland use. Again, this would be a um, naturalized parkland area with naturalized trails, uh, uh, active activity uh, activities for potentially for a season, um, active transport, cycling, walking. Um, there could be potential for safe viewing platforms along the riverfront. Um, and also just allowing people to have a little bit more access to nature and, and pull people into the site for uh, existing residents and visitors alike. And lastly, uh, we have the industrial use, which again is an existing use on the site, but really just ensuring that dam operations are protected from negative impacts of the new uh, uses that are being proposed on site and can really uh, continue to operate at its full capacity. And as part of the land use development strategy, the team um, developed a the theoretical build out scenario. And this was a concept plan to understand how the land uses can be laid out on site, um, how road networks can be laid out and how um, we can estimate the amount of um, residential units, commercial and, and different uses can be integrated onto the site itself. So as you can see here, we have urban commercial uses, larger box uses integrated into the south of the site. Um, in the urban commercial area, there's potential for a central plaza space, uh, mixed use active ground floor, uh, uh, ground floor plates on, on, on the eastern side, uh, fronting the parkland. And of course, uh, low to mid density residential lands to the north as well. And this is just a conceptual layout of the um, parkland trail system, which can have connections um, throughout the site, of course, to viewpoints to the river and also to the to the east to the downtown as well. Um, it can have trail connections that connect the trail along Minnehaha Bay that can also integrate um, a, a trail into the uh, a lookout park that is there today, um, but also integrate a view tower along the site as well. And moving forward, uh, Paul is going to take us through a little bit more detail on the implementation of the project and the land use development strategy. Great. Thanks so much, Michelle. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, ultimately the goal of this project is to see the former mill site redevelopment, redeveloped. And to that end, along with the development concept itself that Michelle had just presented, we've also prepared an associated implementation strategy act as a roadmap for council to see this vision realized. The implementation strategy is composed of three primary phases. The first is an ongoing community engagement phase um, that is intended to intended to run for the course of the implementation of the of, of the plan. Um, the second phase is the development or site preparation phase, and then the final phase being the transfer and build out of the site phase. And I'm going to speak about these phases in a little bit more details. So go to the next slide. So respectively, the overall phasing strategy or the overall um, the overall project schedule, as we see at a high level. Well, we see market forces and funding from senior levels of government are, are likely going to be the major drivers of the redevelopment schedule of the lands. And we anticipate that the implementation strategy will take approximately five years to complete with due diligence, including a more detailed assessment of the site's contamination issues being undertaken in year one, developing a funding framework and identifying a preferred development partner in year two, undertaking land sale, site preparation, the development of a detailed master plan with that development partner occurring over years three and four, leading to the development of the site essentially from midpoint of year four and beyond. All of this underpinned by that, as I mentioned before, the ongoing community engagement to keep council and the public informed of progress. So could go to the next slide. With respect to the ongoing community engagement element, we believe that this should be a flexible, 
and focused on information provision at critical milestones in the work plan. So again, something like selecting the um, selecting the preferred development partner for the site could be one of those critical milestones where we're going to want to share that information with the public. There will also be future opportunities for the for community input into the planning approvals process phases of the development and the development of the master plan. Um, but we believe strongly that general and regular information sharing is key to ensuring transparency with the community and ensuring community buy into the process and the outcome as well. If we could go to the next slide. So moving into the middle phase, which is the phase B or the development preparation, this involves undertaking the more detailed due diligence as it, uh, on the site, as I had mentioned before, developing the funding framework to identify those senior level, um, senior level government sources of funding and undertaking site preparation, including early development of the riverfront trail system. The goal of the second phase is twofold. So first, it's to get the site shovel ready or near shovel ready condition for a developer to come in and undertake the private development actions on the site. And it's also to ensure the financial feasibility of the development. With respect to site preparation, this will involve undertaking site due diligence, demolition, and clearance of any remaining structures and unused infrastructure on the site. The site itself has been fairly well cleared, um, but there certainly are some remaining structures um, and, and infrastructure on the site that would need to be removed. It would involve undertaking the environmental remediation of the site, which is likely one of the, the more cost, uh, costly aspects of the redevelopment of this and is really the focus of, um, of reaching out to senior levels of government for funding. And then, and then followed by site servicing, or at least ensuring that there are upgrades to the existing services so that they can accommodate future development on the site. It doesn't necessarily mean dragging the pipes and road network into the site at this time, but at least ensuring that the infrastructure up to the property line is ready to receive development when a development partner has been identified. So if we could go to the next slide. So with respect to funding, uh, uh, given the size of Sturgeon Falls real estate market and the challenges of redeveloping a contaminated site such as this, it's very likely, as I'd mentioned, that forms of public funding will be needed to make the redevelopment possible. Um, to give council and, 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 and members of the committee a sense of it, certainly if we were looking at larger centers like Toronto or Ottawa or Montreal, even private developers or municipalities in those contexts would also likely be reaching out for senior level government funding to assist with large cleanup operations such as these. Um, so it's, it's additionally that much more important in a smaller, smaller market such as Sturgeon Falls. Um, so again, this is to this is to make the redevelopment possible or feasible. So to that end, we've identified uh, current and active government funding programs at the federal level, um, as well as uh, programs that exist at the uh, provincial level and potential programs that the, the municipality could consider, including the creation of a specific Brownfields Community Improvement Plan solely to assist in the redevelopment of this specific site. There are examples that we do see in Ontario um, in a number of locations of communities that have developed community improvement plans specifically for large redevelopment sites such as this that could act as a model for, 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 for West Nipissing. If we could go into the next slide. So this is speaking to the final phase of the implementation plan, which is referred to as the land transfer and build out phase. This final phase of the implementation will see um, detail on how the land sale will occur. Um, it, it speaks to uh, the preparation of the detailed master plan for the site, which is something that we would anticipate not necessarily being led by the municipality, but by the, by the development partner that's chosen by the municipality um, and the actual build out with options for council to consider. From our perspective, we believe that the preferred scenario will see that a master developer or essentially one party would come forward to work with the municipality to develop the entire site. But we've also outlined in the implementation plan a series of scenarios where the municipality could act as that master developer, working with multiple builders to see the site built out, or even a scenario where the municipality would undertake a standard um, disposal of surplus lands process um, to, to essentially attempt to see development on the site. But certainly the preferred scenario would see a, a, an expression of interest um, or RFP process undertaken by the municipality to identify um, a, a regional or provincial um, master developer who can assist and has the ability um, and, uh, and, and portfolio to assist in redeveloping a site as complex as this. 
This section also of the plan also outlines best practices for procurement of the developer and also best practices related to, um, to shaping the land deal structure between the developer and the municipality. If we could go to the next slide. This is some closing comments, but with that, that brings us to the end of our presentation. I know that we've gone quite quickly through the through through the strategy and the implementation plan, but we certainly wanted to leave room, lots of room for any questions or comments that that committee and council may have. Um, so that does bring us to the end of our presentation. We're certainly happy to answer any questions, but before we do, um, we did want to take this opportunity to thank committee and council for the confidence that you've had in us as we've again prepared this set, this second project for the municipality. And we also wanted to give some special thanks to Stefan and Cassandra, um, who led this project on behalf of council and committee and for their support in, in getting us here, here today. But with that, I'll turn the, the, the microphone back over to the chair and we're certainly available and happy to answer any, any questions. Mr. Hicks, uh, just looking around the table, are there any questions or comments? Councilor Ebal? Well, through you, Mr. Chair, just, I guess, uh, thank you guys. That was pretty impressive and pretty neat to see there what could be done with the property. And planning's always been kind of a, an interest of mine on the side there. So it was really neat to see what you guys were able to think of. and. Uh, I think most people in the community would really like to see a lot of those things at that site. So just a comment. Thank you. Questions or comments? Mr. Chair, if I may, um, I also want to thank Paul, Michelle, their entire team and Cassandra as well for all the work that's been put into this. Obviously, uh, you got the Coles Notes version this evening. Uh, the full report will be provided to council in short order uh, and we'll also provide uh, copies of the report to our economic development advisory group who had uh, a key role to play in, in bringing this forth to council for support um, once council adopts the the document officially we will have it posted on our website for the public and, and developers to see um, obviously a lot of work has been put into this report but now uh, a lot more work needs to be done council's uh, obviously supported through budget uh, one of the key first uh, steps, and, and that's uh, the phase two environmental uh, for the uh, entire facility or the entire property. So that we'll be undertaking that shortly and more information will be brought forth to council with timelines and what. Um, so again, uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, I'm sure council will look forward to the full document shortly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pre. Any other questions or comments? Uh, council Russell? You through you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say that it's nice to see that document. And thank you for the work that's gone in from our consulting partners and from staff as well. Uh, we're going to be talking about our council term plan a little bit later this evening. And this is one of the items that we've identified as a council collectively to move forward on. So it's good to start to see some potential vision there and put things on paper. So thanks for the report. Uh, just in closing, I would just uh, like to add a few comments. Uh, very, um, very neat uh, plan and very neat uh, strategy. I'm looking forward to working with uh, council and uh, the economic development committee. I think it's a really good project uh, for the municipality. So, so for me, back to you, uh, Mr. Chair. So thank you, Councillor Pushane. Uh, next on our committee, the whole agenda is our public works committee, and I'll turn it over to Councillor Gagne. Thank you, <coughs> Deputy Mayor Ristool. Um, first item that we're going to discuss today is a review of the no cut policy. So I'll hand it over to Monsieur Demiard to kind of go through the uh, the uh, no cut policy and see if there's any comments or modification that we would like to entertain regarding the current bylaw. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you. Um, we um, we have this this no cut policy in the past few years. I found that it was uh, there wasn't a lot of benefit to it when uh, when the policy is has a the for an exemption to come to council. It, it seemed to act more as a as a deterrent to uh, your constituents than than it had any benefit. So that said, I thought it would be a good idea to bring it back to council and see what. Uh, council is still amenable to and, and what we need to, to fix in the policy if, if uh, the policy is broken. So we'll start off um, the, the, the 
basically the policy is there to protect our current assets and, and to prolong the life of, of our assets. That's the intent and purpose. It's not to hinder anyone. It's not to, right? So, so we, we need to really uh, keep that in mind. Um, so bullet number one, um, the director, director of infrastructure conducts a, an annual spring meeting. That's, that's currently happening. So every year when we award uh, projects for resurfacing, all the utilities, so gas, bell, hydro, uh, they are all circulated on which roads are going to be paved this upcoming summer, as well as directly impacted property owners. Um, so that's happening. They, they're all circulated a letter saying that your road is going to be paved, you're going to be subject to the five-year no cut. That, for the most part, hasn't been uh, problematic. Uh, number two, um, owners of empty lots developers are also uh, informed so it is the current practice some of the challenges we're seeing is and melanie melanie feel free to to uh, intercede we when when properties change hands uh, we may miss some property so let's say in year three of a of a of a protected road the property changes hands we sometimes miss that we're, we're so i think it's getting better um but we, we, it seemed to be problematic in the past where we'd have a, you know, a new property owner come in and say, well, I bought this property, I want to build this home, and now I can't. I can't get water, sewer, or I can't get gas. or So that was a little bit uh, uh, problematic. Uh, thank you, three, Mr. Chair. What we've done is we've, uh, now that we have all of the road segments mapped in our CGIS system, uh, our staff that take care of the property inquiries that come in from lawyers. So if a lawyer sends in and requests a property inquiry regarding a sale or a purchase, that's now part of the inquiry. That is, uh, we advise them if the, the particular property is on a section of road that's subject to the policy. So we're doing our best. However, if the due diligence isn't made, it's, it is hard to catch. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, through you. Um, to expand on that, I, I think what at the building uh, permit process, we will kind of uh, reiterate to property owners or um, developers that, you know, this property or make inform yourself to uh, ensure that your property is not subject to the five year cut. So just as a kind of a reminder, a, a kind of second barrier. Um, um, only municipally approved contractors are allowed to install water and sanitary. So that, that is for water and sanitary. It, this doesn't take into consideration hydro or gas when they, when they go in. Hydro and gas have their own contractors, which we don't really have a say in. So that's an area we may want to, um, to look into. Um, boring technology, um, that's still a practice that's that's uh, really doable. Um, keep in mind where, where the main lies within the road allowance, you still have to get down to the, to the main. Even if you're boring across, you may not have a complete cut across, but you're still, you still have to, to excavate down to the main, which most times you're going you're gonna to be uh, cutting the edge of that, of that pavement. So it's not a silver bullet uh, solution. So special uh, situations or deviations that must be previously approved by council. So it is the current practice, but it seems like any, any request that would come to council would be approved. That said, why do we need the policy? Right, if, if, if it's gonna be a rubber stamp, all we're doing is, is hindering developers, hindering contractors, hindering property owners, right? And, and delaying the entire process so if you know if it's council's wish to, to not have a policy and, and if, if we're going to approve every single one, then I would recommend we, we abolish the policy because it, it's kind of counterintuitive to the policy. Um, on that note, if if we could maybe if council could give us direction on what would institute a, an exemption right then we could maybe kind of rework the policy so that it would be clear to 
to the applicant that, yeah, I know this, okay, falls under an exemption or not. And it, it's also a direction for, for myself and for, for staff to, to not, uh, you know, pick up the phone. You say, yeah, I know you're under a five year, no cut. You can't cut the, but policy says you can go for an exemption and it just, it delays the process. So if we could identify specific um, situations where an exemption should be considered, then we could avoid all the, the delays and all of that. So that's one example or, or a potential example or solution. Um, for special situations, cuts may be done by a third party, but reinstatement will be completed by the municipality and all costs will be charged back to the contractor. Um, that's currently not happening. So when, when let's say Enbridge Gas uh, cut a, a roadway, they are they are using their own contractor to restore. So just to, to another little glitch in, in the policy. Um, moving on to number number seven. Um, so should an exemption be granted? Then there's a whole scenario on how we retain um, money to uh, as a security deposit. So that when should the cut start to deteriorate within the time frame specified, then we would have the retainer to uh, repair that cut. The, the problem is, is that the utilities don't want to provide the deposit. So now we're into the property owners um, are engaging with the property owners for them to give us the deposit. So again, the policy is not, we're not abiding by the, by the policy. Um, uh, holding a security for, for three years on, on an asphalt cut is probably not, not the best. The, the, the most cuts nowadays under our current municipal um, standard will hold up for three years. It's at the you know generally five year mark where you're going to start to see potholes developing at the scenes and uh, all that. Um, those are my comments. <laughs> We're again looking for direction from council um, on how to improve the policy or abolish the policy or however uh, this council uh, would like to. Uh, see this policy implemented. I will give it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mignon. So I'll open up for uh, questions, comments. Like Mr. Mignon said, it, it's our time to adapt it. So it actually can actually have uh, some bite into it to make sure. But like he said, if we're going to keep the policy or the bylaw in place, we have to make sure that it actually works for everybody. So. So, any questions or comments or suggestions? Conseil Saint Louis. So, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, to Monsieur Damien, uh, I think obviously the policy is required. Right? By no means, you know, if not, then you know we're opening it up to have a lot of people cutting the roads or whatnot. However, I definitely don't think that we should make the policy without any exceptions. Uh, exceptions are there for any rules or every rules. My question to you, however, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it the property owner's responsibility to uh, replace whatever asphalt is being cut when you have a water line connected or your water sewer to a new home? So if you would take a chunk of four by four out of the, um, is it the responsibility of the property owner to replace that? Currently, yes. Okay. Yes. So maybe something that we should add into the policy is that the property owner will only use a vendor or a contractor approved by the municipality. And the same goes to the, um, the other amenities, utilities, that I understand that they don't want to put money down or however that's fine, you don't want to put money down. The work that will be done after will be done by an approved contractor that is approved by the municipality and no one else. That would be my take on it. And that way we're able to make sure that the work being done is 
reviewed or you know looked at by yourself or your employees that the work getting done is up to our codes and our standards. Yeah, go ahead. Through you, Mr. Chair. So currently, uh, any water and sewer in our servicing agreements, we have a list of approved contractors. So that would address uh, that concern where we don't have uh, approved contractors or, or necessarily approved contractors is Enbridge Gas, uh, GSU, um, other utilities, right? So our own utilities, we use our approved contractors, but the others we don't. So that could easily be a, an amendment. Anything else can see anyway? Not yet. Any other questions, comments? I'll see you still. Through you, Mr. Chair, I appreciate the information shared, uh, Mr. Amir, and I know looking at the uh, effective date and the revisions policies going on close to 15 years since we since it was passed. And uh, I was I was here when we worked on this initially, and I think it was put in place because there wasn't anything in place before. So, you know, it was the best effort to put something in place where there was a, a void before. And I, my thought is I think we've had and you've had enough time to see this policy in action and see where obviously there's some shortcomings to it and things that need to be revised. Um, I guess my question to you would be, um, I think we should have something in place. I'm looking for your opinion because you mentioned taking it right out or uh, looking at revising it. And if we are, and I, I think I'm starting to answer the question myself, but I'll give it <laughs> But if we do revise it, would it be possible to bring this back? We've had a chance to look at it here, but based on your expertise and your knowledge in the field to bring back a revised policy that you right. think is something that's practically workable. Because I agree with you too, if we have this in place and there's nothing happening with it or it's not being enforced, then what's the purpose of it? The other side is, do you think in your opinion, we can put together a policy that would make practical you know, application with this? <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely can. Uh, I can put recommendations to, to uh, how to uh, potentially improve each point for council to look at. Um, that's that's a, not an issue. Um, if there's any recommendations or suggestions that, that can come out tonight that I can work with, that would be great. Um, we, we did hear one from uh, Councillor St. Wee. Um, but yeah, I, I have no issues with that. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Monsieur Rignard, uh, we've outlined some special situations or I guess um, some instances in the past where it was brought to council. Is it possible to have, like with the revised or the draft policy, some uh, uh, examples of exemptions? Um, because as I'm seeing it right now, there is the policy doesn't seem to be restrictive right now. It's very open-ended and if we that's just, I guess, my opinion. But if we would go, let's say, like council will only entertain the following exemptions, mm -hmm. uh, you know, based on merit or something like that, I think we, you know, we kind of drill down on the everyone just making an application every now and then. So, <laughs> but, uh, other than that, I think that's it. I'm concurring with everything that uh, was said. Merci, Any more questions? Also, you uh, have it. Merci, M. Gagné. Euh, moi, j'ai une, une couple de petites questions. Euh, C'est quoi le plus, le plus gros problème avec les, les, les codes policiers? Il y a les. Faut-tu connaître pour le nouveau PSO, euh, téléphone, le gaz, l'hydro, des affaires même? So, C'est quoi le plus gros problème avec la code policy, à part de l'asphalte? Um... C'est-tu. OK, je vais continuer. Euh, C'est-tu. Parce que quand on creuse. On ne met pas le même matériel que le chemin. Quand on sait que l'hiver, il y a des chemins qui vont lever euh, de 10 pouces à 1 pied par la clé. Puis quand ils creusent, ils mettent du bon stuff. La plupart du temps, ça, ça ne grouille pas. Ça, c'est ça le dip là, qui, qui est gros problème, right? OK. Euh, pourquoi quand ils font ça, que vous extendez pas? Pareil comme quand on fait les calvettes, ça aussi, il y a bien des tasses et des problèmes. Là. Ils creusent juste pour rien. Au lieu de faire un, un beau grand vide même, tu ne verras pas le dip dans le chemin. So, um, 
through you, Mr. Chair, what uh, Councilor Pellbrand is referring to is, is dissimilar frost heat. So when we excavate uh, in a road base uh, and we backfill with a non-native material, uh, those two materials will heave differently um, during winter months. Uh, so his recommendation is to uh, frost taper these cuts. Now, when you frost taper, let's say a three to one, if you're excavating down to a water main that's two meters deep, for a safe excavation, you have to have a one to one uh, slope ratio plus the trench bottom. So you add a meter or two at, at the bottom. Of it. So if you're two down, you're two and two at the top, that's four meters, so six meters. So that becomes very costly for, for, the, uh, for the property. It, it is, it is a, a suggestion, but keep in mind that you still end up with a seam. So whether you're, you know, even if we, we it definitely reduces the amount of, of uh, frost heaving, what it doesn't do is reduce the amount of seams. You still have those seams that will eventually develop in potholes. Yeah, but good points. Questions? So at the seat. Yeah, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so it, it's the seam issue then that I'm understanding. Whenever you repatch, it's, it's the seams that are causing that difficulty. Water through you, Mr. Chair. So, especially this past uh, spring, um, you know, water gets in the seam and it freezes at night. So it, it opens up that, and then it, it melts during the day. And you know, cars driving over top of it, it just eventually, you know, the road base gets saturated, and and the asphalt starts to uh, to break away, and then you you end up with water. Do have a second question? Um, how long does a, a road, a new paved road, last if it's not cut? Let's say it's a <laughs> lifetime. Of a yeah, it's it's very. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of variables, right? How much traffic? Uh, how how good the the base is? How good the drainage is? How good um, how good the design was at the time the road was built? So a lot of factors uh, come into play. But you would hope that you would get at least fifteen to twenty years out of a, out of a new. Uh, paved road if if you know not all our roads are complete reconstruction so if we're just resurfacing a road you still have that same road base you still have those same issues right um but are we in a position as a municipality to start um you know completely reconstructing every road we wouldn't be able to, to afford it so th there are there are some risks when we do a simple resurfacing project but um Again, we, we're not in a position to start completely reconstructing every single road that we, we need to, to resurface. And that's common throughout other municipalities as well that I've been involved with. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Thanks for the explanation on how it's there. I'm not too sure if I understand everything fully, but. One question, I guess, or exemption for me would be like an emergency circumstances, right? If a water main or sewer backup, something like that, I think that would almost that would have to be an exception in a policy, right? Like clearly stated. But then, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think some municipalities or cities they do something similar, like one year, two year, it's it's a no go, no matter what, and except for emergency. And then anything like you know between three and five, maybe at that point, then it's case by case where it comes to council and then it's kind of spoken about. I think I've seen that before. And then I'm not sure if it helps in terms of seams because once you're cutting at this point, if you enforce that the entire width of the road is cut and you're not kind of just taking out a, a square and leaving one lane, or, you know, then you're gonna kind of have less corners and you're just gonna have some straight seams. So I think I've heard from someone say that that's a little bit better as well if you do the whole width of the road, but that's your expertise, right? It's not really my issue. <laughs> so. so through you, Mr. Chair, that's a very valid point. Um, again, um, when you when you cut the entire road width, um, you you eliminate the longitudinal seam. Longitudinal seams are bad. They, they, they deteriorate uh, quicker than a transverse seam. Um, some research, and we've we've done some of these in my in my past uh, life, where you try and angle the seam. 
And it, what it does is it, it, the tires aren't, aren't hitting the seam perpendicularly or they're not riding on the seam. They're, they're kind of hitting it on an angle. And those seams typically would last longer than... Uh, so absolutely, we can look at language within the policy that when restoration occurs, we want it restored in this manner. Right? And, and that way, when you do provide exemptions, um, then at least we know we would, we've done everything that we, we we've could to, uh, to prevent premature deterioration of that cut. So valid point. Questions? Question? I have a few questions for you, Mr. Um, so, so one thing I guess is, is sometimes it might impact potential uh, growth. Like if somebody can open up four lots to build four new houses. So maybe maybe we can keep that in consideration when there's a kind of a an exemption a request that is made. I, I think feasible if it's worth it. Maybe even we we have to repave that that that, that, that uh, or patch that we've made. Maybe it's feasible to to move forward. So there's maybe a financial aspect that we can look at for exemption. Um, and the other thing was into item number five, um, uh, a special uh, situation of this policy must be previously, previously approved by a council. I would like to add in there that staff make a recommendation before it comes to council. So that way we know if, if if the uh, the uh, property owner was made aware there was a no cut for five years and he did receive documentation and it's coming back, well, it's not like if he, he's been made aware that that situation or the no cut policy was in place. So it'd be good to have all of those recommendations before it actually comes to council. If financially it's worth it for doing an expansion or opening up subdivision, I think there's there's an analysis that needs to, to be brought forward by by uh, by yourself or the administration administration staff saying that you know what financially it's worth it even if we do the no cut and the the uh, tax money that we're going to be creating might compensate if we need to patch it a few times uh, or every five years for example and those would be my only comments to that. Like Monsieur Mignol said, if you have any additional comments or suggestions, send an email to Monsieur Mignol. If you think about something, if anybody, uh, any uh, taxpayers actually have good recommendations, we're, we're doing this policy to, or this bylaw to no cut to actually help everybody and uh, to try to have uh, the least exceptions uh, possible in regards to the no cut policy. All good. Thank you very much. And to that, I will continue to the next item on the agenda, which will be the dump station for recreational vehicles. And to that, I'll pass it on to, uh, to you, Mr. Vignol. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I think everyone has seen the memorandum where uh, in the past we've identified issues with the current location of our RV uh, filling and dumping station along Coursault Road. Um, we have a recommendation, um, and, and I don't think that we're not looking at, at constructing this this year. Or we're, we're basically looking for direction from Council on how uh, they wish to proceed and, and if they basically like this new location and whether uh, we want to be charging for water or if it's going to be a free service um, as it currently is on course law. Um, so I'll pass it back to you, uh, Mr. Chair, for, for maybe comments, questions, concerns on the location and uh, comments on, on whether we want to uh, implement the uh, uh, debit or credit um, water taking. Yeah. Uh, just before we start, uh, Monsieur Lumiel, could you explain <laughs> where exactly the tr the trailers are going to be coming in and how they're going to be exiting, okay. that it's clear to everybody where the location is? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't 
own a trailer myself, but I do believe that the uh, services are on the driver's side. No, no, I mean, correct. The, so the new location, the, the new location. Well, but uh, <laughs> to, to your point, um, when the trailers drive in, they will drive in off of uh, Floral Street. So between the Comfort Inn and the Trombley uh, Chevrolet lo uh, car lot, yep. and then a right hand turn onto uh, Bridge Street and hug the shoulder of the road. So the, the shoulder of the road would be widened and um, services brought into to that area. So that would be um, because the, the services on the trailer, I think, are on the driver's side, you would drive in and kind of uh, be into off the road, but uh, typically on oncoming traffic because of the location, it is very minimal traffic. It's basically only public works that, that are in there. So we are uh, thinking that that would be a, a good location and not uh, in a residential area per se. Um, so yeah, that's the vehicles would approach through Floral and then back out to Highway 64. So in from Highway 17 and back out to Highway 64. I will uh, open it up for questions. Uh, we'll see your rest. This is my uh, thank you to Sarah. This is my uh, maiden voyage. Is sitting at the helm of the council here. I just wanted to to suggest that and if i'm not mistaken i think um, the issue is underwater and sewer and i think that's councillor coloring's portfolio yeah uh, it's uh to to you uh, uh you still, i had the discussion with you all today just to make sure okay. and because it's infrastructure infrastructure is under public works okay. so it is it it is actually under uh, Monsieur and you um um leadership in regard to that portion. I did discuss with Mr. Penhay also just to make sure that I wasn't stepping on his toes and he agreed that since it's infrastructure, he didn't mind me chairing this portion of the uh, of the agenda. If that's okay. Oh that's fantastic. It's just I'm gonna get my report card from the mayor and I don't want to get <laughs> having her chair in place, but that's excellent. Thank you for the clarification. And I, just to finish, I don't have any other comments. I think uh, I was curious where it was too, because I was trying to figure out where it was, but thanks for the explanation of the location. And um, I guess the only question I have, and I think you mentioned it in your comments, is consideration of this this current fiscal year, or are we looking at something uh, in future fiscal years? Mostly direction for this year, because we, we didn't budget for this. So we just want direction as to how we, uh, so to be ready for, you know, for, for next season uh, to, to construct it so that we're ready for the ERV season, right? right. Thanks. Thank you. So, Conseillère uh, Tessier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, on Corsal Street, the water, um, was there misuse of the water at that location? trailers or so i did personally witness um, not necessarily trailers but um trucks with like uh, utility trailers with thousand cubic meter totes uh, filling up quite frequently during during summer months so Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I can just add to that. We frequently get calls at, at town hall reporting in infractions, the, the filling of those those large um, tankers in the back of pickups, the filling of whole water trucks goes on there, car washing. We, we have reason to believe there's a substantial amount of misuse. Um, trailers are not the actually the common source that seems to be using that that filling station right now. And uh, just one more question. With this new location, is there better supervision as to who's using? And again, if I can continue, what, what we're looking for tonight is, is a part of the presentation that uh, Mr. O'Meara has, is there is actually option, if we're moving it, the location to get them into a less trafficked area, of actually building a station that has some type of payment option included in it. So we're looking for whether council concurs with that that's where we're going to go. So whether it's, you know, a, a top card or what the system is, but look for actually a system that rather than providing just free water, that there is some um, payment system, both to take the pressure off because the rate payers shouldn't necessarily be covering for um, folks passing through. And certainly then to make those folks, if they are filling large tanks or large tankers, just be responsible for the, the cost that the system is bearing. 
you can see this here. Well, see, say we. So uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So for you, Mr. Damiano, maybe Ms. Craddock, is this something common in other municipalities? These machines, if you will, that you have to pay, or is this something that we have to look into if those things exist? Uh, and second, to add to that, my opinion would be 100% uh, that individuals, if, and I don't know if there's a way to monitor it, that if you just go with your little blue job because you're going to camp and you're allowed to access a certain amount, but if you're accessing more than you have to pay, I don't know if the system, if there's any kind of system like that, but yeah, anybody abusing the system, definitely it should be, there should be a cost. If I... There, there certainly are a, a number of different systems, and that's one of those things we, we could look at. Um, I mean, there are systems that uh, are used for, for commercial in, in some communities that have sort of full billing systems. Um, we'd be looking at something that's a little bit simpler just to deal with, you know, the, the trailer and the traveler kind of traffic that, that's coming through. Um, and, yeah, there's certainly there's a, there's a bit of a mix. There's some communities that don't provide the service at all anymore. Um, and certainly, I, I don't know, Mr. Mayor, if you have sort of taken a look at how many communities have it, but um, when we did some of the research last year, the communities that still do water tend to have some type of payment module that goes along with it, yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to add on what Ms. Craddock mentioned, I, I do know that most communities around have just removed these dump stations and water taking stations because they were problematic. So I would also be strongly in favor of having some sort of payment method, but kind of to touch on what Madam Tessie or Councillor Tessie mentioned, like, is there a, you know, it's preliminary, but if it's a well-lit area, I know that road's not very well used. So stuff like that, maybe for a night or uh, just to, cause once you have that machine for payment as well, that's added infrastructure that could be damaged kind of, uh, so, and yeah, Mr. Chair, um, so we do have the yard is equipped with uh, CCTV, so that would be an option should should council uh, choose that option, um, where we have some kind of uh, eyes on 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 the system. Um, I don't believe we're we're proposing a, a coin or or uh, monetary, so it would be all debit credit perhaps Apple Pay, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And so you would you would essentially pay a rate established by council and you would be dispensed a known volume of water. So, uh, thank you, Trudeau. Just to add, I guess I uh, like the idea of the location because especially if Goulard Park being a, a recreational park, sometimes you get that strong smell on the way. So it'd be nice to get it out of that area. And, a little bit more secluded and uh, just back to that whole thing of cost uh, the main reason why I believe is because a lot of people who pay these fees for water and sewer should be subsidizing for this and the cost if we're adding this infrastructure it could help pay for that infrastructure that we'll be putting in there so I think that's the best idea in my opinion thanks see uh Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I, I just wanted to comment. I really like the location. I want to open a can of worms when I see this, but can we also look into the field and Werner sites because I understand the Werner site had some water issues over the past few years. And if we can add, you know, the water dispensing, um, you know, machine, I think it could really, uh, you know, kind of deter um, misuse of, of uh, those resources. Well, it's just a uh, Okay, okay. Um, yes, uh, Councillor Corson, certainly we, we've heard about the, the burn situation and, and I'm aware that we've got, you know, um, dump stations up in, in field. Um, if Council would allow us to sort of separate these issues that, you know, we'll bring this one to resolution and we'll bring burner back as a separate discussion if, um, if Council will permit it to go that way just so that we don't have one project tied with the other projects will we'll knock them all off as as individual items for discussion at council 
through you, Mr. Chair, if I could recommend that we um, let's not buy three of these machines, let's you know kind of baby <laughs> steps and let's let's do a trial, and then if if we we need to tweak, then we know what we need for our other uh, our other communities. The only reason we're bringing up is because the Corsal location is a bad location, so that's why this one's coming up first. But uh, they, definitely uh, we can look at all the others once the council is, is happy with with this move. Uh, is there a real need for the local uh, people with Trevors for this uh, service? I think the utilization of the, uh, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, the utilization of the uh, Coors Hall um, dumping station is, is significant in, in summer months. And, and, it, and it is somewhat of a, an economic development uh, opportunity, right? You're, you're encouraging um, tourism uh, in the municipality. Uh, so there, I, I would I would think that there are benefits, maybe uh, directly. Yeah, I think also from through Mr. Chair, also through uh, an environmental issue. I mean, if, if we remove all these dumping stations, what we're going to see is RVs dumping in ditches and uh, in areas that uh, we, we would rather not. Um, so I think that alleviates some of those environmental concerns as well. It's a good service provided not only to our residents, but uh, visitors to our community. And, and uh, um, but we do have an abundant, abundance of them. We have one in Field, one in River Valley, or one in Verner, uh, uh, and we have one in Cache Bay as well. So um, as uh, Ms. Craddock mentioned, I think we're going to deal with Kursal because it's located to a school that's in a residential area. It worked well at the time when I guess we had the Fiddle Fest and all the trailers at the park, but now uh, we see uh, a lot of issues. So by moving it and relocating it and having people pay for treated water, I think is, is uh, something that uh, it seems this council wants to support, but then we'll definitely look at it at the other RV dumping stations and come back because I do think there is a benefit to having them in our community. So, is there room? Yeah, I'm all in favor of uh, charging for that for sure. Uh, so, is there room over there to get the water and the dumping station? Yes. So there's a, there's a sanitary sewer, the same line that goes to the sorry through the same line that goes to the Comfort Inn. So we would be uh, tapping the, the sanitary lateral into that main, and the water same water line that goes to the Comfort Inn. It's a six inch <coughs> water main, so we can easily tap. Um, to keep costs down and because of the location, we would likely do that with our, our own uh, forces in house. Um, so that, that, you know, we, there would be, we wouldn't be have to pay a contractor to, to do this, this work. We're going to do as much of it as we can in house. Perfect. That would be, uh, yeah, that'd be great. And I guess, uh, for users to pay, I guess you would figure out roughly how many gallon goes in a trailer and. You get that amount and that's it. Yep. If you want to go with the uh, hundred uh, per gallon, uh, pay, pay more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. Good. Mr. Chair, I'll be in favor of the cost dispensing option just to alleviate any issues. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, not so much a question, but just a comment that, and I mean, it might not be here, it might be later on. I think what we need to do, though, is to ensure that our uh, citizens or the people, either from the tourism part or anybody coming into town, are aware that the machine you'll have to pay. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not and they pull in, believe me, with a truck and a 40-foot trailer and you pull in to get some water and you cannot, that's probably where you're going to see the vandalism. It might not be from Joe Blow walking down the street and he figures I'll go kick up. That might be the individual. So we just need to make sure when the policy or whenever that comes up that we ensure that residents and people using the system are made aware. I don't know if we can put a sign even as you're turning off the highway, just that people are aware that here's, there is a cost to using or using the machine. more questions good so the only comment i have is to make sure that when we do the uh 
financial analysis that it's a kind of a cost zero recovery. Uh, we're not there to make money, but uh, as uh, I am a uh, taxpayer for water and sewer, um, I pay for it. So I, I'd like for people that are from out of town and need it that they do the same thing as I do pay, pay their share of what they're actually taking. So, and to that, uh, unless Monsieur de you have any other comments or questions, good, perfect. So I'll pass it back to you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor Restoul. Thank you. Councillor Donny, um, I'm looking at the time. I see eight o'clock. I don't know if uh, folks. I know some folks really don't want to, but uh, I guess I don't. So policy, we take a short break. Um, so do I have a mover and a seconder for a short break? Councillor Donny, Councillor Pellerin, all those uh, in favor? So we'll take a short ten minute break. Yes, we do. Oh, sorry. It's <laughs> 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 already folded on. Here's what calling for 10 minute break. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right. All right. See you in 10 minutes. <laughs>
Okay, we're back. Thanks everyone for uh, indulging that short break here. We're going to move into our regular meeting agenda, and the first item that we have is our consent agenda. It is moved by Councillor Pellerin and seconded by Councillor Gagne. Be it resolved that Council for the West Nipissing Municipality hereby approves the consent agenda for April 18th, 2023. So you've all had a chance to review the items in the consent agenda. Your packages. Uh, I, typically, what I ask is if there's anything that people want to bring out of the consent, or if we're okay to move ahead with it. I guess through the through the motion here, it's to accept the consent agenda. So, all those in favor? Eric. So, the next item that we have under the regular meeting is seven point two planning. It is moved by Councillor Gagne and seconded by Councillor Pelletier. Be it resolved that bylaw number 2023-39 being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 2014-45 to rezone certain lands located at 220 Arthur Street from residential three to residential three exception zone R36 shall come into force and take effect on the day it is passed. Yeah, thank you. If you could, yeah. uh, through you, Mr. Chair, this item was brought to the Planning Advisory Committee at its meeting last week. Uh, the purpose and effect of this application is to uh, there's a currently a legal triplex on the property, uh, and although the property is entitled to have up to eight units, uh, this one being a, out in an accessory structure. It had to come outside of the bylaw and be included in a special zone. So what they're doing is they're building a garage uh, with a small 700 square foot um, dwelling within the garage structure on the property where there's an existing triplex. That's it. Do we have any questions on the item? Who's in favor? Eric? <coughs> Nothing under correspondence or unfinished business, so we'll move into 7.5, new business. It is moved by Councillor Pellerin and seconded by Councillor Gagne. It resolves that bylaw number 2023-40 being a bylaw to set the tax ratios for the West Nipissing Municipality for the year 2023 shall come into force and take effect on the day it is passed. Thank you uh, for that. And I, I know that we do have information within our package and there was some discussion around the change to the our large industrial tax ratio. So we can turn it over to Lisa. Certainly, thank you. So um, as we discussed last time, the, the, the ratios reflect that decrease in multi-res that was discussed at council. And then um, I've, I've put in 2.5 for the, the large industrial, but I did say I would bring back sort of where other municipalities are, are sitting around us. Um, I've given you sort of a, a little table of, of some of the, the folks kind of uh, just next to us and, and then giving you a little idea of where some of the high and lows are. It really is a, a range. And so when you see the folks that are at the, the upper end of the, the range, um, you know, we, we have industry that, that, you know, communities that have been really reliant on industry. When we're going down to some of the ones that are at the, the bottom end of the range, and even some of the ones I don't, I don't have shown here, when we get into some of the places in southern Ontario and things like that, we tend to see more of this one-to-one -one type range. And a lot of that I think is because industry has been gone so long from those communities that, you know, it, it's it's not where, the, where they are. So it really is, um, you know, a, a difficult positioning place when we don't have any when we're looking to want to be attractive to potential um, investment to, to come to here. And I've, I've put the 2.5 just because when I look, um, it, it keeps us, it does keep us lower than our neighbors, so competitive to our, our neighbors. Um, you know, when we look at, at Timmins, I know, I know people don't like to use Greenstone. I actually tend to use Greenstone actually as a, as a comparator to us. It's a very large geography, that community. They've got water and sewer. Um, the population density is very low, so they are a, sort of a reasonable comparator to us. Um, so if we're looking at sort of a, a starting point, that is, that is a consideration. Again, you know, council can consider going right down to what our existing industrial rate is, which is sort of a 1.4. Um, again, because we've got nobody in that class right now, it doesn't have any impact to our taxpayer. Um, you know, we had Mr. MacArthur here from MPAC earlier, and we had the discussion last time about whether you know, large industrial puts more burden on our, our costs, on our infrastructure, on our system. And the, the goal that MPAC has is that they catch all that in assessment so that our, you know, large industrial will be assessed 
higher have a higher values is what how the system is supposed to work. Um, I know I'm not being really great and really helpful at saying this is the rate you want to choose, um, but but certainly as I said I, I've put the 2.5 in there keeps us kind of in the middle of the the pack, and um, we we can see after our meeting last week, Mr. Poulin came in and said to me that you know sometimes uh, developers will just be going and looking on our website, so we're not necessarily going to know the effectiveness of what our rate is because developers might just be looking at our website, decide it's too high for their likings and, and move on and we wouldn't even know that they're they're out there kind of looking around. Um, but you know for, for a starting spot, I've, I've just put this in as a, a starting consideration. Thank you for that uh, information. Any questions? No, no I was mostly just a comment. I think if I think the 2.5 is uh, a good starting point because I think last or the last meeting we had talked at 2.75 and it was always good better off to go down to whether 2.5 or 2 or even lower as per North Bay was at 1.4 so I'm definitely be supportive at the 2.5 and let's see if we can attract people and you know go from there and if not then we'll revisit it next year and hopefully we'll get some more and um, more content right no other questions with the motion to vote, all those in favor? Carried. It is moved by Councillor Gagne and seconded by Councillor Pelleret. Whereas Council received the budget and financial controls policy at the April 18th meeting, be it resolved that the budget and financial controls policy be approved as presented, and be it further resolved that the budget and financial controls policy shall form part of the municipal policy manual. Thank you. Um, again, I don't know. Like to I know we've had some discussion. Yeah, I don't know if it's really an update because I, I do thank you for receiving it so well last time, and um, you know, I, there wasn't any, any amendments since mm. we talked last time. So, great. Any questions on the uh, item? All those in favor? Carry. It is moved by Councillor Pelanay and seconded by Councillor Gagne. Whereas Council received the term plan at the April 18th meeting, be it resolved that the term plan for the year 2022 to 2026 be approved as presented. Excellent. So we've had a number of uh, discussions about the term plan. We've had opportunities to provide feedback and input on to, into it. I don't know if there's any, I'll open it for one last uh, round of thoughts if there's anything from Council members. Not seeing, so we'll put that to vote. All those in favor? Carried. It is moved by Councillor Tessier and seconded by Councillor St. Louis. Whereas four quotations were received for brushing and ditching services in the West Nipissing Municipality, and whereas Council concurs with the recommendation received, be it resolved that the quotation for brushing and ditching services on Dokies Reserve Road in the Municipality of West Nipissing be awarded to ProEx Construction, having submitted the lowest quotation of 108,000, meeting all specifications. Thank you. Again, you've had that information in your package, a chance to review it. Are there any questions regarding that? Councillor Pellerin? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Russell. Just a question. Uh, how do you go about to, do you have a database of contractors or where do you advertise for this? We advertise on our local uh, on our website, um, Mercs. Elisa can probably elaborate on that. Uh, yeah, so we, um, we have on our websites. Everything always gets posted to our, our website. And certainly our local contractors know that that's where, where things are. So we don't circulate it directly to the contractors. Um, some projects do go on, on Mercs, and Merck sends out notification to folks that have listed and, and you know, requested automatic notifications. Um, you know, and that's, that's our usual methods of, of advertising. Great. Thank you. No other questions I see. All those in favor? Carried. It was moved by Councillor St. Louis and seconded by Councillor Cochain, whereas two proposals were received for the management, operation, and maintenance of the Cash Bay Trailer Park in the West Nipissing Municipality, and whereas Council concurs with the recommendation received, be it therefore resolved that the proposal for the management and operation and maintenance of the Cash Bay Trailer Park uh, the, for the Municipality of West Nipissing be awarded to Bernard and Michelin Guinnett, having received the highest rating score of meeting all established criteria. Thank you for that. Again, we had the information in our packages. I'll open it for any questions anybody may have. 
Not seeing any, all those in favor? Carry. It is moved by Councillor Sanouille and seconded by Councillor Tessier. Be it resolved that Council grants permission for the following temporary street closures for the West Nipissing Pride Parade to be held on Saturday, June 10th, 2023, beginning at 1 p.m. Ethel Street between Main and King, King between Ethel and Queen, Queen between King and Main, and Main between Queen and Ethel. Thank you. Uh, any questions? See any? All those in favor? Carried. That's it. I made it through. I have a, a CT 10.1s and mayor's report. And I'm going to keep it super short because I'm a Leafs fan too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so two two quick things. I just wanted to uh, say thanks to Barry Bertrand and his small team uh, who put on a scotch nosing event this past weekend, raising funds for the hospice room at the West Nipson General Hospital. So that was a great success, and I know the hospital uh, pre appreciates that. And an event coming up uh, April 29th, our community living organization has their annual gala, big event for them, big fundraiser within the community. So if anybody's interested, please reach out to community living. It's an uh, important event. I know they've been, uh, as lots of our, activity, our activities have been uh, with that pandemic, we've shut down a lot of things. So it's good to see them back with our annual gala. So, it is moved by Councilor Tuesday and seconded by Councilor Corshane. We resolve the bylaw number 2023-41 being the bylaw of the West Nipissing Municipality to confirm the proceedings of Council at its meeting held on April 18th, 2023. Shall come into force and take effect on the day it is passed. All those in favor? Carry. It is moved by Councilor TCA and seconded by Councilor Sandy. We have resolved that the meeting of Council held on April 18th, 2023 be adjourned. Just, just, just a question before we end. Do we need a motion like for the granular resurfacing in the asphalt? Or did I did the for refreshing? Oh. oh. They'll come next week. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> so are those in favor of adjourning the meeting? Very good.